Welcome to MA3D1, the World Math Module on Fluid Dynamics. This video is about hydrostatics. Hydrostatics is that branch of fluid dynamics that studies static fluids. That is, the velocity of the fluid is zero everywhere. And the governing equations that we have so carefully derived, the Navier-Stokes equations, reduced to just this balance. The only non-zero terms are the pressure gradient and the external volumetric force, for example, the force of gravity. And this equation, if the external force is a constant, which it is for many situations in day-to-day -day life, then this equation can be trivially integrated to give you the pressure uh, in terms of a constant of integration P0, which for an incompressible fluid remains arbitrary. Uh, here we have also assumed that the density is a constant. If the density or the acceleration due to gravity or the, or the volumetric body force is not a constant, then one would have to integrate this, uh, assuming that the external forcing is a conservative one. Conservative forcing simply means that it can be written as the gradient of something, which means it can be, it is, uh, it can, this equation can be solved for a unique uh, function for the pressure, perhaps up to a constant. Uh, noteworthy uh, observations about uh, this simplification are that obviously because the fluid isn't moving it's not accelerating either so the left hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations vanish and the viscous stress also vanishes so in this case the stress in the fluid is simply given in terms of the pressure thus for hydrostatics there is no difference between a viscous Newtonian fluid and an ideal fluid and the second observation is that pressure rises in the direction of gravity. Even if uh, these uh, variables rho and g are not constant, this equation gradient of P equals rho g implies that pressure rises in the direction of gravity. The rate at which it rises may vary from point to point, but at every point pressure rises in the direction of gravity and remains constant perpendicular to the direction of gravity. This can be seen by, for example, if we take a direction D. Dot with grad P, where D is perpendicular to G. In that case, this dot product is zero, which means the rate, sorry, the gradient the directional derivative of the pressure along D is zero. Uh, there are two consequences of this uh, simplification we are going to follow. The first one is Archimedes principle and the second one is the shape of the meniscus, but these are not the only two consequences. These are just examples of the consequences and th these examples should give you enough um, exposure and experience with uh, hydrostatics. So Archimedes principle states that when you immerse a body in a fluid, it uh, experiences a force of buoyancy, it loses a, a uh, appears to lose some of its weight. So let's see why that is. Let's say we have a body immersed in a fluid and the fluid is static, the body is also static, so the pressure inside the fluid is given by this law of hydrostatic pressure. And uh, we are going to find out how much force does that uh, imply. The force on the body as we always write, is the surface integral of the stress dotted with the unit normal, unit outward normal to the body. In this case, because the stress 
is given only by the pressure term. We can replace T dot N by minus P N hat dA and apply the divergence theorem. How do we apply the divergence theorem to this? This was exactly the situation encountered in one of the problems in example sheet one. So go back and check how we do that. Uh, and the result is uh, the volume integral of gradient of P with the negative sign. So we now substitute the law of hydrostatic uh, equate gradient of P to rho G and that's just the, that's exactly the weight of the fluid displaced by this volume omega because we are substituting rho in here right? and therefore Archimedes, so this is the statement of Archimedes principle that states that the reduction in uh, the weight of the body is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. And here is a simple uh, physical picture in order to understand it. Suppose we did not have the body in the fluid at all, but let's look at the region the body would occupy if it were immersed in the fluid. But inside, the, inside this surface, inside the, uh, this surface delta omega, we still have the fluid in equilibrium with the outer fluid. And because of equilibrium, the weight of this fluid is balanced exactly by the force exerted by the surrounding fluid. So now if we replace, if we remove the fluid inside this volume and replace it by our body, which fits perfectly in that volume, the surrounding fluid does not notice the difference and it continues to exert the same amount of force. So therefore, the net force of buoyancy exerted by the surrounding fluid on that body is what it used to be, which was the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. So that's Archimedes principle. Force of buoyancy is the weight of displaced fluid. The next topic we are going to cover as an example is uh, a balance between hydrostatics and surface tension or an interaction between these uh, two agencies. Right? Uh, in order to apply and in order to appreciate this, we need a little bit of background. And that background is the Laplace law for pressure jump across an interface. So let's imagine you have a spherical drop of radius, radius R. I told you that the uh, so there is fluid inside and there is, let's say, air outside. And you have an interface of the fluid. The interface of the fluid is always under tension and the amount of tension is quantified by this quantity called surface tension. Right? So sigma is the surface tension which is written here. And as a consequence, the interface acts like this, uh, like a, uh, the surface of a stretched balloon, the elastic material of a stretched balloon. Uh, when a balloon is inflated, the pressure inside is higher than the pressure outside. And uh, one can use mechanics to figure out how much the pressure inside is higher by. So it turns out, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to state this without proving it or deriving it mechanically, that the pressure inside is higher than the outside pressure by an amount two sigma over r. In general, where this factor of two r comes from can be explained a little more. In general, if you have a curved interface with two different curvatures along orthogonal directions, kappa one and kappa two, then the jump in pressure is given by the coefficient of surface tension times the sum of the curvatures along the two orthogonal directions, kappa 1 plus kappa 2. In this case, kappa 1 is 1 over r and kappa 2 is also 1 over r because the radii of curvature, uh, sorry, the curvature uh, of the surface of a sphere is equal to 1 over r in every direction. So we are going to use this sort of law whenever we encounter uh, surface tension at an interface. A consequence of this 
is uh, the shape of the meniscus at an air water interface. You remember when we discussed the properties of fluids and uh, floated a paper clip on the surface that the uh, surface of the interface depressed and formed a meniscus. Uh, we are going to develop a one dimensional theory of this meniscus now. Let's derive a governing equation for the shape of this meniscus. Here is the wall of the paper, paper clip. And this curve given by y equals h of x is the shape of the meniscus. If this is a one dimensional meniscus, the length of the paper clip perpendicular to the plane of the surface is infinite. We can assume that for some portions of the paper clip. And we are going to apply uh, hydrostatics. There was a little bit of flow, but we are going to ignore that um, and derive a governing equation. Uh, in order to derive this governing equation, we need to know the curvature of this interface. And given the shape of the surface in terms of this function h, from geometry, we can deduce that the curvature is h double prime, that's the second derivative, divided by 1 plus h prime squared, that's the first derivative, the whole thing raised to 3 halves in the denominator. And the curvature perpendicular to the plane of the paper is zero because it's uniform along the third direction. And in the air, the air is assumed static and the air is assumed so light that the density, uh, the pressure variation with height is not perceptible at these scales. This height is merely a millimeter. We'll actually see how much we get for this height but it's of the order of millimeters and pressure does not rise very much. Pressure in air does not rise very much over the height of a millimeter. So we are going to just take the pressure to be a constant. In the water, we may not do that. And we will see the reason why. Uh, water is much heavier than air to begin with. And given that we have a hydrostatic situation in water also, we have the pressure Give in water given by a constant P0, which is the pressure in air, minus rho g y, where y is measured from the flat uh, interface level. Okay. Gravity points in the direction of negative y, and therefore we have a negative sign there. So uh, now, if we equate the value of the pressure you get in the water right below the interface to the value that one would get by accounting for the jump across the interface, we get the following equation. The jump across the interface is sigma kappa 1 and starting from P0, the jump is relative to P0 and the reduction in pressure relative to P0, which happens at y equals 0, is rho g h of x. So equating the two gives us an equation for uh, the shape of the meniscus h of x. This is a differential equation. I'm going to label this equation as star star. Now let's see if we have any hope of solving these, this equation. So I have a quick aside here, which attempts to find a solution by, and it does so by multiplying both sides by h prime of x and noting that both the left hand side and the right hand side can be written as total derivatives. And therefore this equation can be integrated once and once it can be, once it is integrated once we get a first order differential equation with no explicit dependence on x. So this has got to be a separable uh, kind of differential equation and we must be able to at least write the solution in terms of some integrals. It so happens that we are able to derive an explicit solution but before we do that we'll follow the tradition of fluid dynamics and non-dimensionalize our equation. So you note here what's happening. Let's look at h double prime of x. h of x has units of length h prime of x is the slope and is dimensionless. It's length over length, so that is dimensionless. So it makes sense 
to add it to 1. So the denominator is dimensionless. The numerator, we have a h double prime of x. This has units of h, h over l squared for some length l. So this has dimensions of 1 over length. This has dimensions of h. So if I take the sigma on the other side, rho g over sigma must have dimensions of 1 over l squared. Rho g over sigma must have dimensions of 1 over length squared. And we are going to use that to define a quantity sigma over rho g will have dimensions of length squared so we'll take the square root of it and we will obtain a length now these this these combinations of these parameters sigma over rho g square root it should give us a length whatever number we get for that length we will call it the capillary length remember this is how we non-dimensionalize governing equations we take the parameters that are given to us and non-dimensionalize that is rescale our dependent and independent variables by quantities that only depend on the parameters that are given to us and have the dimensions of the dependent and independent variables respectively so here both h and x have dimensions of length and we have constructed a quantity of with dimensions of length from the parameters given so we will use that for uh, non-dimensionalizing because that will be our characteristic length scale as soon as you substitute you will notice that the equation becomes this I'll, ca I'll call this equation star and if we do the same trick that we did before multiplying by h prime but in this case h twiddle prime and integrating we'll get this equation this is the equation this is a first order di differential equation for the uh, meniscus shape but what you notice here is that including the concept of integration none of there are no parameters in this problem there are no dimensionless parameters that appear in this equation that means the shape of the meniscus must be universal the one dimensional shape because there are no dimensionless parameters uh, remaining in this equation uh, on the next page I have presented a solution for, uh, for this differential equation it takes some amount of effort but not it's not too hard and what one obtains is this expression for h as a function of x it is given implicitly it's really given as x as a function of h with uh, arbitrary constant of integration x naught which just determines uh, the reference zero of your coordinate system so let's see what the shape of this meniscus looks so here i have plotted i have managed to plot h as a function of x since we had x as a function of h, what I did was discretized, get, got a number of points along h, calculated the corresponding x, and plotted it. The dotted line here shows 0, uh, and this shows the shape of the meniscus. Okay, As you can see, the meniscus starts, uh, depending on where the meniscus attaches, to our paper clip we have to start at the uh, with the slope uh, corresponding to the point of attachment and from that point on we can use this solution but a property of this solution which I will show you in a minute is that uh, as the meniscus becomes deeper and deeper the slope becomes higher and higher and in fact at a special value of h equal to square root of 2 the slope becomes infinite the meniscus becomes vertical how do we see the situation that the meniscus becomes vertical here we can substitute h prime h prime twiddle goes to infinity in that case this term 
approaches zero and we have h twiddle is square root of two which means that our meniscus in these dimensionless variables cannot become higher cannot rise higher than square root of two times our capillary length so here we have our result that h max is less than or equal to square root of 2 times the capillary length. This result has the following practical implication. Suppose you are trying to float a long pin. The pin has some weight and depending on its weight it depresses the meniscus more or less. If the depression on the meniscus according to its weight is greater uh, the depression needed to balance the weight is greater than square root of L then the pin will not float it will sink and that's why only light objects can be floated heavy objects cannot be supported by this surface tension right? uh, before we finish let's go back and try to estimate the value of uh, the capillary length for water. Capillary length for water is square root of sigma over rho g. For water, sigma is 72 times 10 to the minus 3 newton per meter. And uh, Density times gravity is 9800 Newton per meter cube. You can see the Newtons cancel. One of the meters cancels with the uh, with one of the meters in the meter cube. After the square root, we get a length. And if I quickly evaluate this, I get 0.072 divided by 9800. 2.71 millimeters and if I multiply this by square root of 2 I get about 3.8 millimeters uh, 3.8 millimeters so the meniscus cannot be uh, cannot rise higher than uh, 3 point or, or be depressed more than by the same logic depressed more than 3.8 millimeter. If uh, you have the opportunity and if you want an interesting physical challenge, you might try and measure the depth of this meniscus. Especially some of you physics students who want an interesting project. Not that we have a lot of time on our hands. But you might want to think about how do we measure the shape of a meniscus on these scales because this sort of technique can be used to measure surface tension. Surface tension is generally not an easy quantity to measure. Here we have developed the shape of a meniscus. There are other, um, uh, other techniques for measuring surface tension which are based on hydrostatics like we have derived here and one of them is the pendant drop method. Now in example sheet uh, I believe 4 or 5 in one of them the one on dimensional analysis I have asked you the largest the size of the largest drop that can be suspended as a pendant from some substrate. So that type of a uh, setup is easy to establish. In fact, I was able to establish it in the lab and I have that uh, in, on, in my office, not in the lab. I, I was able to establish it in my office and uh, uh, take a picture. And you can see, look at that picture in the example sheet. And there, you must have used dimensional analysis without any differential equation to derive the dependence of the size which can be easily measured on the surface tension. So 
let's see how your answer compares with the capillary length that we derived here. So that concludes this video on hydrostatics. If you have more questions, feel free to write to me. Um, always happy to receive your questions. Uh, and look forward to seeing you in the next video or the next live session. Bye-bye.